Our brain is the seat of our subjective experience. Without a brain, we wouldn't be conscious of the world around us. This is what makes us us, and what allows us to move, think, feel, and plan. And yet, we have very little idea about how the thing works. How can we optimise our brains if we don't have a model of how they should work? While no complete model of the brain exists, and although scientists are still a long way from understanding its ins and outs, there are still an incredible amount of things to learn. Not least, some new discoveries and ideas that completely change the way we think about our grey matter. So keep watching to get a better picture of just what's going on inside your head, and how to get the most from it. So at its simplest level, the brain works like a little mind map. Our grey matter is made up from roughly 86 billion neurons, neurons being brain cells. There are over 100 trillion connections between those neurons, which are known as synapses. The average neuron has a whopping 7,000 connections to other neurons on its own. This huge network, which we can liken to a mind map or a spider web, is unique to every single person and is sometimes referred to as a connectome. In many senses, you are your connectome. Neurons are composed of a cell body, or soma, with sprouting dendrites and axons. Dendrites look like little tendrils that reach out across the brain in order to connect with other neurons. The axons, meanwhile, are the tails that protrude from the cells. These connections, or synapses, between neurons can be localised, but in some cases connections can span large portions of the brain. Some axons can be up to one metre long. Synapses take the form of small gaps across which signals can travel. Signals, meanwhile, are actually electrical impulses. When a neuron fires, which is known as an action potential, an electrical impulse will travel down the axon to the synaptic terminal at the end. This is the output port, where the electrical impulse will then jump across to stimulate the dendrites of other neurons. Action potentials are binary. That's to say that a neuron is either firing or not, and there are no gradations of intensity. When a neuron receives enough stimulation from incoming dendrites to raise it above a certain threshold, it will then fire and carry the signal onwards. In some cases, input from one neuron may be enough to cause this. In other cases, multiple inputs will be required to depolarize the cell. There'll be then a brief cool-off period before the neuron can fire again. This electrical activity is what gives rise to our subjective experience of the world. So when a neuron fires, it will correlate with an experience or an action. For instance, there are specific neurons that correlate to points within our visual field. So if you artificially stimulate these neurons with an electrode, which can actually be achieved during open brain surgery, you'll see points of light appear like pixels on a monitor. Other neurons correspond with motor units that cause twitches within the muscles. Other neurons still combine to represent our memories, ideas and experiences. For example, there will be a group of neurons that represent our friends, or a concept like freedom. Because of the interconnected nature of neurons, activity in one area will bring to mind related concepts and ideas, giving rise to our train of thought. This alone raises some interesting questions. If you were to surgically remove the right neurons, could you completely destroy someone's memory of a specific person? How many neurons would that take? This line of reasoning is sometimes referred to as the grandmother cell, or Jennifer Aniston neuron. We know, for example, that brain damage can, in some cases, result in shockingly specific memory deficits. For example, there are recorded examples of people losing the names of all the vegetables, while being otherwise perfectly fine. When a neuron fires in the occipital lobe, or visual cortex, it's easy to understand how this directly connects to the eye and creates a solid experience. But how do we experience something like the feeling of walking through the woods, or the number seven, or loneliness? What is the brain translating this into? One leading theory that I particularly like is that of embodied cognition. This theory suggests that all our experiences ultimately relate back to the physical experience and interactions we have with the world. Our thoughts would be too abstract to mean anything without a grounded experience in the real world. So when someone tells you a story about walking through the woods, you only understand this by visualising and feeling the neurons that would fire if you were walking through the woods yourself. Abstract quantities like numbers ultimately must also relate back to physical experiences. But while the brain might look like just a giant web, the truth is that it's actually more organised than that. Generally, neurons are grouped by function, thus we have a visual cortex and an auditory cortex which handle precisely what you would expect. More abstract functions like forward planning and emotion are largely handled by the hippocampus and amygdala for example, so you have a different brain region for all kinds of different tasks. The brain can also be roughly divided into three larger components. The forebrain, which is responsible for our higher reasoning and is thought to have evolved most recently. The midbrain, which is the smallest part of the brain and thought to act like a relay area for auditory and visual information, 
and the hind brain, which is the primitive brain. This counting the cerebellum, meaning the little brain, which helps us to coordinate movement and may play an important role in our ability to predict outcomes, the hind brain and midbrain are generally grouped together as the brain stem. This part of the brain is responsible for many of our most basic functions, such as breathing and digestion, and most of this occurs largely unconsciously. We can also divide the brain down the middle into two halves called hemispheres, and these two halves are then connected by a thick bundle of nerves called the corpus callosum. But lest you think that the brain is neatly organised into predictable components, the truth is a lot more complex. Many functions rely on the interaction of multiple brain regions at once. As well as looking at individual brain regions then, neuroscientists are also interested in common patterns of activity throughout the brain, which they can analyse with things like fMRI. These include the likes of the default mode network, a network of regions that work together during daydreaming, and the salience network, which correlates with focus and attention. This is called functional connectivity, but even this is overly simplistic. More recent approaches use dynamic functional connectivity to look at how different brain regions interact over time. Activity in one area might mean something completely different if it is immediately following on from an activity in another area. Not only that, but in non-typical development, it's possible for functions to migrate to entirely different parts of the brain, as in the case of people who undergo hemispherectomies, losing half of their brain, and still retain a shocking amount of functionality. In your brain at any given time, there'll be countless neurons firing in these different regions. This activity is what can be detected via an EEG, or electroencephalogram, and this is where I get our brainwaves from. Contrary to popular belief, however, we do not experience a single type of brainwave at any given time. One part of your brain might be in theta, while another is in alpha. So when someone tells you that your brain is in the theta state, either they don't know what they're talking about, or they're really talking about the average activity across the entire brain. This only tells a small part of the story. This is possibly where the misconception that we only use part of our brain comes from as well. In truth, we only use part of our brains at any given time, but this is exactly as we would want it. Too much activity across the entire brain could result in a cascade of uncontrolled electrical activity, and this is what happens in a seizure. The brain must be modelled to perfectly manage the amount of activity so as to eke out optimal performance without triggering a neuronal avalanche, dancing on a knife edge. This is called the critical brain hypothesis. Overactivity in specific areas of the brain can also cause issues like OCD or anxiety, whereas inactivity may correlate with feelings of malaise or drowsiness. Thus, another important job for the brain is to carefully manage these levels of activity. There are numerous mechanisms in place to accomplish this. One such mechanism is smart organisation. Increasingly, researchers are viewing the brain as a maths problem and attempting to model the kinds of networks that would allow for complex thought. It has been suggested that this organisation is akin to a small world topology, meaning that neurons can connect across great distances using the minimal number of connections. Physically, this is made partly possible by the sulky and gyri, the grooves and bulges on the surface of the brain. This wrinkled appearance helps us to fit more brain into our skulls, yes, but it also provides handy little shortcuts, like wormholes, to connect disparate neurons. More fundamental are neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that are released in the brain via various mechanisms and modulate the activity of neurons. Neurotransmitters are stored at the ends of axons, at the synaptic terminals, located in the synaptic knobs, and contained within little sacs called vesicles. During an action potential, these chemicals are released and will thus affect the postsynaptic neurons, those neurons on the receiving end of the synaptic gap. Neurotransmitters include the likes of dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin and GABA. Each of these can be placed into one of two categories, excitatory neurotransmitters that increase activity and make our neurons more likely to fire, and inhibitory neurotransmitters that decrease activity and firing. Hormones can also act like neurotransmitters in some cases. Neurons are also used to kind of tag and alter an experience. They can make us more likely to remember something. They can alter our mood. But as ever, neuron transmitters are more complicated than they're often given credit for. Your brain is constantly awash with a cocktail of different neurochemicals. You don't simply produce more serotonin and then suddenly feel better. For starters, neurotransmitters also need to interact with receptors in order to have a direct effect on a specific neuron. So if a neuron doesn't have a receptor for that specific neurotransmitter, it will have no effect on it. Different brain regions are more or less receptive to specific neurotransmitters, or they might have different reactions to them. Neurotransmitters also have countless different roles within the brain and body. For example, cortisol is often described as the stress hormone. However, it's far more complex than that. Cortisol also modulates hunger, it helps us to wake up, and it increases our focus, 
Cortisol also affects the way that fat is stored, and the effect of testosterone. Likewise, serotonin is the feel-good hormone, but it is also inhibitory and can thus incur drowsiness. And this is especially true as serotonin also converts into melatonin, which makes us sleepy. Likewise, something called short-term plasticity shows us how the activity of neurons is altered in the short term. So for example, short-term synaptic depression occurs when specific neurotransmitter vesicles are depleted. This results in a connection that is less likely to fire, in many cases. Short-term synaptic facilitation, meanwhile, occurs when a buildup of CA2 concentration, among other factors, makes the synapse more active. Temporarily increasing and decreasing the sensitivity at specific points in the network can drastically alter the flow of information through the brain, and thus should be a critical component of any attempt to model neuronal activity. For all these reasons, simply ingesting supplements to increase one neurotransmitter or another is not an effective way to increase cognitive performance. As I've said many times, this is akin to trying to fix a watch with a sledgehammer. And over time, the brain can upregulate or downregulate specific neurotransmitter receptors in response to what it sees as an overabundance or lack of particular chemicals. This is how users develop tolerances and addictions to mind-altering substances. So instead, we should focus on proper nutrition to ensure that the brain is able to synthesize all the neurotransmitters it needs as it needs them, along with a balanced lifestyle that helps us to achieve the necessary balance. The aim is to build a brain that can transition seamlessly from one state to another as the environment dictates. Further complicating matters is dendritic computation. This refers to the ability of dendrites themselves to carry out basic maths. This occurs through a number of processes, including the use of membranous spines that protrude from the dendrites like little branches and form compartments. These spines can connect to individual axons, and they can act like filters by offering additional resistance, as well as spacing apart different signals to introduce a temporal element. In other words, a longer spine might slow down the signal so that it arrives at a slightly different time than a signal from a different axon. This way, dendrites themselves are able to alter the effect of an incoming signal and even carry out rudimentary logical operations such as AND, OR, and ZOR. Far from inert input nodes, as they were described by the old point neuron hypothesis of the brain, they act much closer to the complex switches found in microchips. Then there are the glial cells. Whereas your grey matter is made from neurotransmitters, glial cells are the white matter that actually make up 85% of the brain, so they're probably pretty important. These cells play a number of key supporting roles, though many of these are still mysterious to us. Supplying the neurons with nutrients and cleaning up byproducts, for example, are two things we know they do do. And we now think that glial cells may also play an important role in enabling action potentials, and thus determining which cells fire and which do not. There are numerous different types of glial cells, such as oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and microglia. There are even gliotransmitters, which are neurotransmitters that interact specifically with certain glial cells. And to think that most models of the human brain don't even include glial cells. Many don't include neurotransmitters, simply because we don't know enough about them. The brain truly is a mystery to us. So, so far we've painted a picture of a static brain. Such a brain would be largely useless, however. To survive, we must be able to adapt to our surroundings and change our behaviour and approaches. To this end, the brain is plastic and malleable, constantly transforming and changing shape in response to inputs. This is brain plasticity, or neuroplasticity. Through neuroplasticity, we're able to grow new connections between neurons, strengthen the existing connections that we use most often, and cull those that we don't need, even birth entirely new neurons. This activity is more prolific in some parts of the brain than in others. The defining rule of neuroplasticity is often described as neurons that fire together, wire together. That is to say that if two neurons are repeatedly activated at the same time, they'll reach out over time and form a connection through a process called long-term potentiation. For example, the axons might get myelinated, meaning they're better insulated to carry the signal faster and without damage. This is how habits can form, and it's why association works the way it does. And likewise, neurons that fire apart, wire apart. These simple rules can give rise to shocking organisation throughout the brain, however. For example, the motor cortices of the brain are often remarked upon for being organised in a way that represents the shape of the body, 
with the neurons for the hands being located near the neurons for the arms, etc. But given some thought, this makes sense. After all, we're most likely to move in that order. We rarely move our hands without also moving our arms. And the same goes for the foot and the leg, leg and the hip, hip and the stomach. This very nice explanation comes from the brain that changes itself. We can tap into this amazing plasticity to learn any new skill, however it can also be a negative force. For example, one of the reasons we find it so hard to move our toes individually is that they're so often welded together in our shoes. This literally fuses the neural maps for the toes together, such that we can't move one toe without triggering movement in the neighbouring areas. Neurotrophic factors are chemicals that support the growth and health of both developing and mature neurons. These include the likes of brain-derived neurotrophic factor and nerve growth factor, and we can increase these via our diet. Our brains are most plastic when we're young, however, and typically become less plastic as we age. But there are many things we can do to slow the loss of plasticity, such as exercising and gaining new experiences into old age. So there you have it, that's a pretty comprehensive crash course in how your brain works. I hope you learned something new. If you did, please like and share, that helps me out more than you know. And subscribe too if you'd like to see more like this. The main takeaway is that the brain is impossibly complex, and we are constantly guilty of oversimplifying it. We just do not understand the vast majority of the brain, and we're going to see this theme a lot more in some upcoming transhuman themed posts I have planned. Let me know if I missed anything in the comments below. And of course, if you're interested in optimizing both your physical and cognitive performance, then you may be interested in my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training. There's a link in the description below. Likewise, I go into this in a lot of depth in my print book, Functional Training and Beyond. Either way, thank you so much for watching this one, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.